uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and um, great to hear you speak, Anna. I mean, I've followed her career since since the start, and uh, it makes me feel old when people say to me that they read my book before they got started. But there you go. Um, by way of uh, introduction, I don't have um, rainbow pants on, um, but I do spend half my life in lycra, and. Um, I guess if there's sort of a, a hallmark over the last 12 years for my expeditions, I've never raced anyone. I've always sort of shied away from that sort of shoulder to shoulder competition, but I've always been f in a hurry. I would be a rubbish nomadic traveler. I've always been out to try and take on firsts or fastest, and my big passion is to sort of make broadcast projects about those. And I got a, a, an early break with the BBC and uh, I've shared, shared a lot of my uh, documentaries, you know, across the across the UK and beyond. Um, what I thought I would do in the next while is really focus on what's happened in the last couple of years, because it was, it was really the culmination of everything that's happened over the last 20 years. I'll, I'll rattle through a few of the adventures over the first sort of decade, and then I'll focus on what finished six months ago. How on earth do you get around the planet in 80 days? I mean, it doesn't take a PR genius to get the hook. Um, it's a one-time prize. Can you do the first human-powered around the world in 80 days? But we were aiming to take nearly 40% off the previous world record. So there was no reference point for this. So what I'll do is I'll show you a short film um, about what we did. And I'll keep saying we, because I'm one guy on the bike, but I had a team of 40 people behind me. And this was a very expensive professional project, and I'm just one guy on the bike. If I fail, everyone fails. But... When you watch this on social media or Red Bull or GCN or however you're following the adventure, it, the simplicity of watching a single athlete belies the complexity of a project like this. So here you go. I'll, sh I'll show you what we did in a short, short clip, and then I'll give it a bit of context. I'm going to cycle around the world in 80 days, from Paris around the planet 18,000 miles. I've been building towards this since I was a 12-year-old boy. And it's just about ultra endurance. It's just about physically and mentally, can you do this? The alarm goes off at half three in the morning, you're on the bike at four to actually get through it. Don't try and fight it. Just sit steady on the bike and do the hours. You just need to commit to not stopping. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on Mark. And I was really, really struggling. I really hit rock bottom. I'm feeling it 13, 14, 15 hours into a day. He definitely is pushing himself beyond whatever he's pushed before. It hurts. It really hurts. I'm not sure if that sells it at all, but I mean, I can talk about the complexity of the logistics and the, the team and the training and the nutrition and all the rest of it, but the X factor to get around the world in 80 days is your ability to suffer. And uh, that's about experience. Um, that's not a hero statement because I live in Edinburgh. I'm not the fastest, best bike rider in Edinburgh. I train with people all the time who are just phenomenal on the bike. Their bike skills, their, you know, their, their sheer athleticism. That is not my forte. My, my forte is to not stop, ever. Whereas a lot of guys would sort of have had enough racing each other over 100 miles. You know, I don't really get started until we hit about 1,000. Um, no, genuinely, look, I'm six foot three and 90 kilos. If you were to design an ultra endurance pro athlete. He wouldn't look like me. But I was a 12 year old kid who read about somebody who had cycled from John O'Groats Land's End in the local paper, the Dundee Courier, if you're from Scotland. And um, I didn't know that thousands of people did this every year. I took it. I went to the farm car, obviously the Landy, got a highlighter pen and found the roads that joined Land's End to John O'Groats. Or being Scottish, I wanted to do it the other way around. And um, I took it that evening to mum and dad and um, dad, being a bit of a grumpy farmer, just told me off for putting highlighter pen all over the car atlas. Um, Mum, being slightly more supportive, said, why, why don't you try something smaller first? Because you've not cycled off the farm before. Um, so I recruited a friend, and we spent uh, months planning, and then we spent three days cycling across Scotland. Coast to coast, took three days, 45 miles a day. I was 12 years old. When I was 15, I soloed. John O'Groats Land's End, that was my first thousand mile journey. And these adventures quite naturally, quite organically got bigger and bigger. Um, I graduated with a perfectly good economics and politics degree 
was giving lip service to the fact I was going to work in finance, but really I sort of lived these two lives. Academically, I was doing fine, and I, you know, I genuinely was going to be an accountant. But then um, I'd, I'd done all these big adventures. They'd got bigger and bigger over the years. I'd been a ski instructor out in Italy. I'd ridden horses very competitively. I had a sort of, you know, a typical life for somebody growing up in the highlands of Scotland where it was closer to the ski slopes than it was to school. And um, I graduated from uni and I thought, well, why don't we go on one big adventure to end all adventures? This wasn't a career. The aforementioned father still doesn't think it is. Um, I, I jest. Um, and uh, for me, it was just get this out my system. I thought, I'm, more, I'm you know, student debt, what's a bit more debt? Let's just go as big, if we've only got one chance, get, let's go as big as we can dream. And uh, I thought, well, let's cycle around the world. Now, I assumed that the circumnavigation world record would be something which was coveted, professional, that it would be up there with the sailing circumnavigation world record, well out of the means of your amateur. So I couldn't believe when I found out that only five people had ever done it and the record stood at 276 days. Now, I don't wish to be disparaging about anyone who has cycled 18,000 miles, but I did think that was very slow. <laughs> uh, so I, I looked at that and I thought, what's going wrong here? Why have the last three blokes come home within like a week of each other? It's pretty obvious what they're targeting. Um, I thought, right, blank sheet of paper. Here was my crude sum first time around. I can ride a century a day, 100 miles a day. I knew I could do that. 100 miles a day for 18,000 miles, 180 days. Allow a day off a fortnight for flights and recovery. And that adds quite neatly up to 195 days. So my target, 195, old world record, 276. And off I went. Now, I didn't really grow up wanting to be on telly because I was homeschooled until I was high school and I, we didn't have a telly. It wasn't part of my makeup or language at all. I got into telly because it was simply a way that I thought I could give return on investment to sponsors. I had no passion at all for storytelling, and this was before social media. It was just simply the idea of, you know, I studied economics. This is going to cost a lot. I don't have the money. I need to thank them. You know, job done. Very utilitarian way of thinking about it. I met an amazing man called David Pete, who took me under his wing for the first six years of my career and really handed me that baton for his passion, his life's work in observational documentaries, capturing human stories. I was in Alaska filming with him and he told me he had myeloma and he didn't, he didn't live much longer. But um, I've been very, very lucky to, learn, uh, to work with some mentors like David who, you know, in a broadcast sense, you know, as, as well as some of the athletes and coaches I've worked with have taken me from this level, going solo, unsupported, wild man style with a camera at arm's length. When I set off, they said, if you do well, if you capture this journey, It'll be a half-hour BBC Scotland-only documentary. Thankfully, it grew arms and legs and became a much bigger deal. But, you know, I set, set out um, with, uh, with a simple idea, 100 miles a day for 18,000 miles. So this is a photograph taken in the Punjab region coming out of Pakistan into India. My route the last time took the southern tier through Asia before going down Southeast Asia, across Australia, up New Zealand, North America, and then the finish. The sum total of that is I came home in 194 days and 17 hours. So the press story was about the 80 plus days that smashed off the record, first sub 200 day circumnavigation. The way I saw it, I came home within eight hours of what I said I would, which doesn't really account for half a year on the road. Armed guard through Pakistan. I got, there was a day in Louisiana where I went over the bonnet of a car and then I was mugged that evening by a gang. Not a good day. Um, but anyway, you know, I'm only gonna tell you one or two things there, but my point is, when you come home within eight hours of what you said you would after 18,296 miles, you do scratch your head and go, is that my personal best or have I just done exactly what I said I would do? And it got me pretty obsessed over the years since then with this blueprint of, you know, make a plan and make a plan properly on what you think you're capable of and then work the plan. You know, the, the romantic notion of athleticism and certainly endurance sport is, you get out there and, you know, red-blooded adrenaline and you just figure out what you're made of. And there is that. There's your life experience. There's your res resilience. But ultimately, when it gets really tough out there, you need to have a plan to work off. And it needs to be your plan. Right now, th um, I'm helping three women uh, try and set out to break the female circumnavigation world record. There's an Indian lady, an Irish lady, and a Scottish lady. <laughs> Sounds like a bad joke, but it's not. It's happening. <laughs> They're all setting out this year. 
Now, when all three of them came to me, um, because anyone who's cycling around the world tends to email me these days, um, I I spoke to them and I said to all three of them, because they all came to me saying, I want to know about nutrition, I want to know about training, I want to know about bike choice, I want to know about all the technical stuff, logistics, route. I said, I'll help with all of that. But question number one, what's your, what's your plan? What's your target? And they all said to me, 144 days, which is the female circumnavigation world record. I said, right, I'll help you with all the other stuff, but only once we've talked about that. Because if all of you set out this summer with the target of getting around the world in 144 days, two out of the three of you are going to fail in real terms. And all three of you are going to fail in the sense that you've not actually targeted what you're capable of. Figure that out, and then the rest can follow. The rest is detail. And whether it's the teams that I take, or the solo expeditions, or or the businesses I work in, nothing to do with sport at all. It's always about figuring out the plan and working the plan, which sounds mundane, but when you actually nail it down to the realities of what I've done and what my teams have done, it gets pretty exciting. Now, that's not a hero statement again, because I've failed at about a third of the expeditions I've taken on. I've never failed because of a lack of planning or, or commitment. I've failed because you don't control everything. I feel because there's so much which is out with your control. And athletes are so bad at trying to change the plan and training or actually out there, depending on whether you have a good day or a bad day. And I I keep it very simple. Just affect the simple things. Commit to your ride time or the the time to the climb or the ocean row, whatever you're doing. Recovery time, really respect that. Get your food and your, your hydration in. Those are four things which I can do consistently. So rather than doing less on the tough days and more on the easy days, just put the time in. And the long-term average will take care of itself. It sounds like boring sort of marketing talk until you nail it down into the realities. And I can show you through the 12 years of professional expeditions that I've done, you never do better than what you set out to do. It's amazing how close you come to that original, that original plan. So a few of the other places. Um, Followed up with a nine-month exped down the length of the Americas, Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, trying to climb the high peaks of Denali and Aconcagua en route. So that's quite an interesting way to start an expedition. Three weeks living in a freezer. Uh, Sticking to cold places, I then uh, took a a team further north than anyone's ever gone before in a small vessel. So we went 800 miles north of the Arctic Circle in an ocean rowing boat, which what you can't see is that's got a flat keel. And the idea is if we get stuck in the ice, like we pretty much are, um, you can pull it out and tow it like a sled, but that's a 1.3 ton sled, and you're well beyond rescue when you're 750 miles north of the Arctic Circle. So if you commit to an ice field like this, you've got to get yourself back out of there. Don't, don't stand there. Um, so yeah, that's the reality of it. So I j- I, there's been lots of expeditions. I'm just going to mention one which went horribly wrong, because it would be unfair to stand here and just say they all went well. Um, I I took a team to try and break the one-month record for the Atlantic. Now, that until recently was, that was your four-minute mile of ocean rowing. The mid-Atlantic going from east to west, we went from Tarfea, Morocco, to Port St. Charles, Barbados. And about two months ago, a team of four did this. They they broke the one month. And for years, that's been the big prize in ocean rowing. Who's going to go sub one month? When I say big prize, there's about 500 people on planet Earth who have rowed an ocean. But you know what I mean. It was a big deal within a niche sport. Um, the record stood at just over 32 days, and we put together a team which we thought could absolutely smash this. We had three top flight rowers and three top flight adventurers. The idea was the river rowers, the guys who were used to battering up and down the Thames, would have the physical and technical advantage. They could balance the boat and make it go fast. And the three of us who had a lot more expedition experience would have the psychology for two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off for a month which is brutal when you're rowing as hard as you can for 12 hours a day and never sleeping for more than 90 minutes at a time. Now, that formula worked until we capsized. On day 28, 500 miles from the finish, we went upside down. And to cut that story, we spent 14 hours fighting for our lives. We spent the first six hours swimming back from the upturned vessel to the life raft, diving down and trying to salvage the kit to... to, um, to have us found. Otherwise, we were waiting for planes to fly out from Florida to do grid searches of the oceans, and that's proper needle in a haystack stuff. Very few people come home from that. So this is a rubbish photograph taken at one o'clock in the morning by a Taiwanese cargo vessel which reached us, and then getting from that little life raft onto something with a nine-meter deck height the size of a football field 
in a storm is very, very difficult. When I say difficult, coming alongside and getting the guys who hand cope very well uh, up the ladder was, was difficult. When I actually got my feet on the ladder, people ask, is it difficult to do this? And I scampered up there. No stress at all. It's amazing what adrenaline does. Don't, it's afterwards you get upset about it. At the time, it's amazing how analytical you go in a situation like this. I came home. I got married eight weeks later, which was not a knee-jerk reaction, but that happened. <laughs> and... Um, <clears throat> I took two years out from being an athlete. I really got the fright of my life out there. I mean, sadly, I've seen people pay the ultimate price, especially in the mountains um, and a few other places. I've, I've seen people, you know, out there taking on their big dreams and always questions, you know, what's worth it? Where's that balance? But that's the first time in my life I truly thought, I am going to die. And I came home and I thought, I'm done. I'm just going to turn my camera the other way and I'm going to capture other people's stories. And I spent two years presenting the build-up to the last Commonwealth Games that happened in Glasgow. Went around the entire Commonwealth, meeting young athletes, and absolutely loved it. But when the 11 days of sport finished in Glasgow, I sat down with my wife and my mum, who works full-time in the business, and said, I'm not done yet. I've absolutely loved this. But I couldn't take myself out of the equation. I've been inspired by everyone I've interviewed. I've held the microphone and asked the questions for the last two years. But I wanted to be doing what they were doing. And so much to the disappointment of my, my wife, I said, look, well, what I negotiated, which is a word that some of you might understand, what I negotiated was my, my daughter at the time was two. I've got two daughters now. Harriet was two. And I sort of, we sort of said, I believe I've got more. There's always been a fight between the wild man element of these adventures and the sheer performance of them. I've always been thinking, where's my next meal? Where am I going to sleep tonight? But I'm also trying to go fast. What I really wanted to do was put all my cards on the table and just say, what's possible? You know, I, I didn't care if there was no media on this one. I didn't care if it wasn't the most sensible business plan. I mean, you know, the most sensible thing to do is just take the next BBC contract and be a sports presenter. But I said, I, I can't look back. I always ask that when it's difficult. I always ask that question. What would your 70-year-old self say? And my 70-year-old self was saying... You've got to figure this out. You, you, you can't live your life thinking you've, you, you've, there's more, but you've just never quite tested it. I got the scare of my life after the Atlantic. But I, so what I negotiated was I had until Harriet went to school. That gave me three years. She goes to school in August. <laughs> so I, I sort of, you know, once that hurdle was out of the way, I, um, I, 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 I thought, well, what could that be? And I was kidding myself if I ever thought it would be anything else. There's only one prize I was interested in, and that was the world. Everything else is small talk compared to the circumnavigation. Um, there's a hundreds of great routes out there. We can argue all night about that, but it's the world. I mentioned it at the start. I really think the cycling circumnavigation should be up there as coveted and as professional as the sailing one, considering the scale of the sport. And um, I'd watched with, with awe and with fascination, and people had taken my record 194 days, and taking chunks off that. Now there's big changes in the sport. The rules had changed. And um, the amount of support that people were taking had changed. So it was no longer like a five pannier bag, you know, wild man, hairy legged, uh, you know, touring trip. It was now really sort of either, either frame packing or, you know, adventure racing or, you know, going fully supported. So I decided, you know, let's just take all the unknowns out of the equation. This is no longer about adventure. This is absolutely about performance. So the record was held by a New Zealander, an ex-Olympian. He was actually a retired speed skater, uh, but a phenomenal bike rider. And he's held the record in 123 days. But no disrespect to Andrew, I wasn't trying to break his record. And I put a team together over a three-year period to figure out what is the ultimate. I knew it would be naive to come straight back to the world. I hadn't done anything serious on a bike for a matter of years. And um, so I thought, year one, we'll, take, we'll, we'll do a big ride, a big race, a big record, which is experience for me, a training ride for sure. But it's a publicity stunt more than anything else to gain the massive sponsorship and backing and broadcast that I'll need to take on the world. I knew to go fully supported, this was going to be a very expensive project. Um, so I took on the Cairo to Cape Town world record. Length of Africa, 6,000 miles. It's exactly a third of the world in terms of distance. So we took that record from 59 days. It was held by a South African 
down to 41 days, 10 hours, 22 minutes, which is a record that I've still got. But the roads in southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya have now been completed. So there's about a, a good 800 kilometers there, which when I did it was dirt road. So if there's a record you want to have a crack at, this is the one. There is now an unbroken ribbon of tar from Cairo to Cape Town, and you can go at least two days faster than I did. So if you want to do that, come and chat to me afterwards. But um, yeah, still going, still going unsupported, frame pack, packing, averaging about 160 a day uh, down Africa, which you know, is not that mind-blowing, but you know, the African continent has certain challenges. The Sahara Desert, the Ethiopian highlands, as I say, some pretty gnarly roads in southern Ethiopia and northern, northern Kenya. Last uh, 2016 was all about building the team, building the finance, build, building, the, building the plan. And this was the plan. So it's still an 18,000 mile race. The only difference really between 10 years ago and now is 10 years ago, it was ride time. So around the world in 80 days would have been 80 days riding. Now, the clock never stops. So it has to include transit time. It happened because about five years ago, somebody went for the record, rode the continents, and then after each leg, took recovery time. So his total time was considerably different to his ride time. So he kind of spoilt it for all of us because Guinness World Record archived his record and said that wasn't quite what we meant. You know, new rules, the clock never stops. Um, so if you want to get around the world in 80 days under the new rules, it's 70, according to my sum, 75 days riding, three days of flights, and two days contingency. So leg one takes you from Paris to Beijing, through Europe, Russia, Mongolia, China. Leg two, across Australia, up New Zealand. Leg three, five and a half thousand miles from um, Anchorage to Halifax. And then leg four, we sort of jokingly called the sprint finish, which is 1,100 miles from Lisbon through Madrid and back up to Paris. For each of those legs that I've just described, you've got 12 hours of faff time, 12 hours contingency. So you've got 12 hours between Paris and Beijing to get it wrong. Something I stressed with my team quite a lot before we started was, if we faff for five minutes every time I'm off the bike, that adds the best part of two days to the record. So to ride, you can do maths, 18,000 miles in 75 days, you're averaging 240 miles a day. So most sort of you know, good endurance bike riders could wrap their head around a 240 miler, but a 240 is not a day when you've got a cracking tailwind, the sun shines and everything goes your way. It's not a day when you wake up fresh and you start pre-dawn and then long after the sun sets, you crack 240. 240 miles is your average day and you have to do that every single day for the next two and a half months. Now that's why it was so hard to get sponsorship for this because a lot of would-be sponsors turned around and said, why are you calling this entire project around the world in 80 days? We get it in a PR sense, but surely you're risking too much because wouldn't you be better to go out there and say I'm breaking the record, 123 days, and then surprise everyone with the 80 days? Because if I'd come home in 81 days or 91 days or 101 days, it would look like I'd failed. And I got what they were saying, but I, I you know, it goes back to what I said right at the start. You never do better than what you set out to do. Plus, in the world we live in, earned media value is not about a documentary at the end, a book at the end, and telling the story afterwards. It's about real time. It's about day one capturing the imagination and building a global story. I knew that the, 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 the finish line story would be the punchline, but getting people engaged in a global journey like this from day one was how you create value for the partners. So that's why you know, I was adamant. If we believe we can get around the world in 80 days, that's what we're going to talk about from day one. And last April, when we went public, um, that was it. Day one, we had a story to tell. This wasn't announcing a story which a year later we were starting. The day we announced it was the day we left for a 3,000-mile training ride around the coastline of Britain, London to London via the coastline of England, Wales, and Scotland. It was brutal. Harder than any part of planet Earth to cycle around. I'm not joking. I averaged 225 miles a day, and I finished with a hamstring injury didn't give my team a lot of confidence because after two weeks, I couldn't have carried on. So this photograph's taken at four o'clock in the morning, 2nd of July last year at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. This is the start. This is the race. And we're going we're gonna to rattle around the world. Um, quite different to the last time, you know. 
Last time was full touring. This time took a year and a half to build the dream machine. And I'm in the saddle for 16 hours a day this time. Every day starts at 4 a.m., four times four hour sets, 16 hours. Get off the bike about half past nine in your scratcher, hopefully by quarter past half past 10, five hours sleep. Alarm goes off at half past three, back on the bike at four repeat for two and a half months. So we had a flying start, went really well through Europe, uh, basically cleared Europe a country a day. Six countries in less than a week, through Moscow in day eight, and then day nine, the whole race nearly ended. I crashed hard at five o'clock in the morning, and I broke um, some teeth, uh, completely cracked some teeth, shunted six of them into my gum, because uh, I took the fall with my left hand and my face, and I fractured my radio head. So I put a crack right through my left elbow. So from that point, I had two months to ride, and that was the big concern. So this is a photograph of my physiotherapist, not a dentist, and uh, my bike mechanic rebuilding my teeth just east of the Euro Mountains in Russia, learning on the job. Uh, this is a quick clip I wanted to show you, which shows the relief of getting through leg one. I was cycling the last kilometer to Bad Lang and uh, the Great Wall of China. This is the end of leg one. There you go, the sun setting's behind me. It's 10 past seven at night, 6,675 miles from Paris in 28 days. So I think that's about 238 miles a day average. I'll take that. And uh, yeah, what a finale through China. It's been awesome. You can, you can kind of see the relief on my face. I, I all, my greatest fear was always getting a silly injury in the first couple of weeks and not being able to carry on. You know, there was so much speculation in the press and damning commentary on social media last April, May, June, just saying this is ridiculous. Like this is six months after the finish. And when you do something like this, there's a tendency afterwards for it to sound inevitable. People are talking like this about like it was the next big thing on the horizon out there to break. No, it wasn't. If you look things this time last year, people were saying this was nuts. And my greatest fear from the start was that they were right. Um, I got some silly injury, or if I didn't hit the 240 every single day from the start, you're not gonna make it back. If you don't hit that target for three, four days, you know, you're not sort of gonna start knocking out 300s 300 mile days, it's just not possible. You're already at the upper end of what that average is, is, is gonna be. Um, from touching down in Perth, Australia, to me, riding out was 35 minutes. That was actually, you know, the, the, the plane hitting the runway to me riding out. So this is kind of where I'm saying, it's not just about me riding the bike. This is the years of planning. Having people on the ground, meeting me straight through. You try this at an international airport. By the, by the time the rest of my crew come through with our 400 kilos of kit, I'm 60 kilometers down the road. So those are the margins, and that's the planning that goes into it. Um, some pretty empty miles across Australia. And um, I only threw this guy in as a point of reference. This guy's an absolute legend. He's 21 years old. He's a Londoner, and he's called Ed Pratt. And check him out on YouTube. But... When I left from Paris, he left from Perth, Australia, and we cross in the middle of Australia. He's trying to become the first person to ride around the world on a unicycle. He's been out there for three years. He's gonna finish this year, and I, for one, am gonna go out and ride in with him because I think it's absolutely legendary. Um, I rode with him for about 20 minutes. What a lovely chap. And then I shot off because he's very, very slow. But, uh, but I just love the tenacity of it. I love the... I just, you know, the Brits have always been good at thinking out the box and doing things quite adventurously. When I, when I gave you that stat about ocean rowers, about 500 people have rowed the ocean, or rowed oceans, about 350 of them are British. We're good at this stuff across the board. And we should be proud of that history, be a part of it. I wanted to show you a really quick clip. Every day we posted a morning video diary and an evening video diary. I'm just going to show you one of these. It's uh, start, start at day 47. And, um, yeah, slept, slept deeply, but uh, only for just over four hours. So, um, woke a couple of times hearing the rain on the night. Uh, Laura's looked at the weather charts in the, uh, and um, it's quite a big storm coming this morning. 
Uh, you can feel the wind moving the motorhome and it's right on the nose. So, uh, Nikki, my wife, stopped showing Harriet my morning videos. Because apparently daddy looks quite scary <laughs> at half past three, quarter to four in the morning. But do you, you get my point about the fact that that's not a time to get clever? You know, when you're waking up at half past three and you're on the bike at four, it's not a time to turn to your team and say, how hard are we going to try today? What's the plan? When it's like that, you're in idiot mode. You've got to know exactly what's expected of you and exactly what's expected of your team. That day, like any other day, we're riding 16 hours. doesn't matter whether it's a headwind, a tailwind, whatever. The average will take care of itself. If you've not decided that long before you start, trust me, you're never going to figure out your personal best when you're out there. Um, it, was a, it feels a little bit unkind talking about New Zealand in four and a half days, but uh, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a punchy ride through the middle of winter. It was absolutely brutal to get between Invercargill and Auckland, racing for the ferry and then up to, to the flight, knowing that I'd get my longest recovery on the entire world flying up to Anchorage in Alaska. Um, it was amazing to see the amount of support growing as I cracked on through the ride. You know, it started off with a, a modest following, but I could see on social media, but more importantly on the roadside, just people coming out and being a part of it, which when you're living in this little performance bubble is amazing to see. You know, just people riding sections with me, in parts of the world I'd never been to before. And just this very simple idea, can you get around the world in 80 days? You know, capture the imagination. I love that. So it took me out from my own suffering and um, you know, team dynamic to, to realize, yeah, this is making impact. I mean, we were sharing it a lot with thousands of schools, Blue Peter, if you're still watching that. Um, you know, BBC Breakfast and other networks covered it in a big way. But globally, GCN, Red Bull Media and others really sort of took it out there, took our content and took it to a, to a massive audience. The, the last big push through North America was, was probably psychologically where I was in my darkest place, I, I guess, where I've ever, than I've ever been. Um, thank goodness I've handed over control to my team. I'm no longer the team leader. I'm just the guy on the bike. Because psychologically, I'm now two months in, coming through the prairies and in the Great Lakes. I was not in a good place at all. Put it this way, I would finish 400-kilometer days, you know, 250-mile days. I couldn't remember them. You know, Laura, my, my, my performance manager, would ask me about that day, about the people who had met me and come out and ridden with me and the terrain. And couldn't remember. I'm sure you've driven places and can't remember the drive. Can you imagine riding 400K and not remembering it? You're an idiot. I tell you, it's not very helpful when you're trying to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> and this is me trying to push back 9,000 calories a day. The final race up through Europe was pretty exciting, uh, but it's quite hard not to get ahead of yourself. Everyone was just so excited about the finish, talking about the finish constantly, and yet you've still got this ridiculous routine to do every day, this four, four times four hour sets a day. On day 75, uh, just coming across the Pyrenees, at 10 o'clock at night, I crashed, and I crashed hard. It was wet roads, and I lost control of the bike. And rather than dropping the bike where I was, I sort of scooted across the, the carriageway into the oncoming traffic, and there was a big HGV coming the other way, which stopped in plenty of time probably between me and the bar away. But my point is, we laugh about it now because three days later it all worked out and that got sort of swept under the carpet with the finish. But on day 75, the whole race nearly came to a finish, if not worse. And all that was really talked about after that, apart from are you okay and let's sort the bike out, is let's everyone else celebrate the finish. You know, to, I, I spoke to a journalist just west of Madrid, you know, riding along on the Bluetooth, who said to me, Mark, can we chat like we're in Paris together? I'm going to embargo this interview until the finish. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll try. But I've still got a 1,000 miles to ride. Talking about getting ahead of yourself. And there was that sense creeping into the team, a bit of complacency, a bit of this is the victory lap. And you can't blame the crash on that, but it was definitely a moment when we thought, right, hang on a second, let's just do what we've been doing well for the last two and a half months. Let's everyone else celebrate the finish. Some of my eccentric friends. And... Um, Amazing the amount of people who came out to be a part of it in, in Paris. Just, just wonderful. So this was the 18th of September last year, having cracked the, the one-month record, the most miles cycled in a month, um, and, um, and the world. And there's the team. Um, all I'd really like to say in summary to, to, to what we just pulled off, and I say we again, because I say 40-odd people behind me in this project, is we had a plan, 75 days riding, 
three days flights, two days contingency. The new circumnavigation world record, 78 days, 14 hours, 40 minutes. We use 14 hours out of our 48 hours contingency. Full stop. So I've been asked so much in the last six months, is that your personal best? Could that be beaten? Will that be beaten? You know, one journalist quite rationally said, you know, you crashed three times, you had big storms, lots of bad luck happened. If you get rid of all that, surely you'd go faster. That sounds like a rational argument until you realize we must have had as much good luck as bad luck because guess what? We did exactly what we said we would do. So, you know, we took 39% off that record. We took it from 123 days down to, to, to 78. And um, I'll answer the, the obvious question straight away. No, I am not going to cycle around the world a third time. Absolutely not. Uh, it hurt way too much. Despite that sort of big realization of, I feel like I left it all out there. My whole team would tell you it's the hardest thing they've ever done. And yet the painful truth is, we simply pulled off a plan. Uh, that, that, that's quite painful as an athlete because it, it begs the obvious question of, well, how much more is there? Is it mechanical? Is it logistical? Is it physical? Is it psychological? What is that advantage? I'm fascinated by all that. I think that's absolutely at the heart of all great ambitions. And, and I think we're just starting to scrape the surface in terms of endurance as to what we're all capable of. So hopefully food for thought. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mark. That was yeah, incredibly inspirational. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so questions for Mark. Okay, I'm going to run back. Good training for Sunday. Thanks for that. Um, I was just wondering on the mental side of it. Say if you've hit, I don't know, 50, 60 days and it's feeling kind of the toughest mentally across, say, America. Yeah. From there on, does it, the mental side get harder every day? Or do you reach just a point where it's just a constant mental toughness, but, it's, but it sticks at that point. The reality when you're not doing any big expedition is you very quickly go from the macro view, seeing the entire plan, to really seeing it in its, its minute detail. So, 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 so the simple answer to your question is, um, I was really only living this in, in singular days and four-hour blocks. When you get out your scratch scratch you at half past three in the morning, the idea of riding a 16-hour a day and 240 miles when you've only had five hours sleep, that's enough. So the fact that yesterday might have been good or bad or indifferent almost doesn't matter. Yes, there was chapters looking back, you know, of really tough weather, really good weather, you know, but, but, but the reality is, to your point, you don't go deeper and deeper and deeper into sort of some never-ending sort of cycle of pain and depression. You, uh, you, it's, it's amazing the psychological roller coaster that exists within any given day. Um, you get on your bike at four o'clock and it's just about waking yourself up and riding through dawn, making that first set count. It's so easy for your first set not to count. Get through dawn and all I just thought about was get to eight o'clock, get into the RV and have a 10 minute power nap. And the little mind trick there was, and then I'd have 10 minutes food back on the bike after 20 minutes. Um, by doing that, I only had to ride four hours, then I got to sleep, 10 minutes, I'll be it, and then a 12-hour ride, rather than getting on the bike at four o'clock and going, I've got 16 hours to ride. Little mind games like that are amazingly powerful. But I think my team would reflect that I'm pretty difficult to deal with when I end up very, very sleep-deprived and focused like that. And it, what's also interesting with my team is I saw how difficult it was for team members joining the trip in the second half. Because the more success you build in the project, the more you have to lose, the, more, the, the, the further you're going to fall. So team members joining through Australia, New Zealand, North America, I could see to begin with, they weren't working at their best. They weren't absolutely comfortable and relaxed in their roles because they were almost paralyzed by fear of being the one that, that, that messed up. Um, so it was really interesting how quickly people could hit the ground running and, and play their part. I needed everyone to be thinking for me, like working ahead of me, you know, absolutely taking care of detail. But um, yeah, it, you, you, your, your question about being halfway across North America and in the absolute dies, you've, you've built up so much momentum in the project 
it's not, it's not, even, it's not even on your mind to, to stop. I'm always asked that question, and the reality is, as an endurance athlete, if you put yourself through weeks and months of something like this, that's when you need a performance team watching you like a hawk. Because I don't think, you, by the time you cannot physically and psychologically keep going, I don't think you'd be in a place to make that decision yourself. It's a very rational, objective conversation to have. You know, did you consider giving up? And how do you keep going under difficulty? The, rea the reality is you're in idiot mode. You're in a very dark place. You're suffering a lot, but you can keep going. And you need your performance team to be absolutely looking after you at those points. I'll make the other answers shorter and happier, if you want. <laughs> How many, how many um, people in your support crew have taken or created their own experiences? Your know, physio, has your physio? Yeah, yeah. yeah Laura Penhall, who quite a few in the audience know. I mean, Laura was um, a top physio at three Olympic Games with Team GB, uh, with the Paralympics. But she also happens to have rode the Pacific Ocean. So I, I wanted to have people who were top of their game technically. They had the education to do their job, be it logistics or medical or whatever. But I also wanted people who had that depth of experience, that resilience from having done stuff. You know, for me, it's always about, you know, being more than your technical ability. Being valued for who you are rather than what you do. If you're just valued for what you do, you know, anyone else can do your job. But I, I always looked for people who had that life experience. And after the Atlantic capsize, I, know, I need to know how people think in, under a lot of stress, a lot, a lot of pressure. Um, we're only six months on from the world. And I think it's taken a while for us all to recover, genu genuinely. Um, so it's not like anyone is saying, you know, we're off to do something else on that scale straight away. But you've got a group of people there with amazing capacity, amazing capability to work under pressure. And I have no doubt that they're going to go on to do amazing things. Uh, I've got two questions, if that's all right. Uh, first one, do you think there's a common thread between ultra-endurance athletes? And is it something that you're just born with, or is it something that can be learned? I think it's a concept of grit that a lot of people are talking about now. Uh, second question is, I think it's safe to say you probably pushed the boundaries that medical science have ever seen in terms of cardiovascular endurance over a prolonged period of time. Was that tested, or was, did, did you kind of look at that along the journey, because your body would have changed drastically. Yeah, yeah, it did. I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief, because I know there's other hands. Um, on the, I genuinely think you can learn to do ultra-endurance. We were chatting briefly before about the fact that, you know, distances and duration scares people to the point where we just don't create the time to train to do something like this or create the time to, 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 to do it. And that's understandable. I mean, I've been on a 22-year journey to take on something, two decades of experience. But, you know, anyone could have lived in my shoes and done what I had done as, a, as an endurance bike rider. It is mainly about psychology when it comes to ultra-endurance. And on the physical side, as I said before, it's not about being the fastest or the most powerful. It's about not breaking down. It's about having the conditioning, the all-round conditioning, not to injure, never to injure. So that's where I think a lot of pro athletes would struggle. So they might be a phenomenal pro rider, but you know, I think a week of this and you'd get you know, just tendonitis and repetitive strain injuries cropping up. To sit in that position for the best part of 16 hours a day is you, know, you have to adapt. You know, your nutrition, your, your body, the punishment, it's never about the muscles. The muscles will just take care of themselves as long as you fuel them and hydrate them well enough. It's always about your contact points, your feet, your backside, your hands, your neck. Um, you know, can you endure? So the mental side you learn through pushing the distances, pushing the, pushing the duration, and, this, the, and, and the confidence more than anything else, the quiet confidence that you can, that you can suffer well. Um, the part of the, the, I guess that leads quite nicely onto this, the, the physiological. There's not a lot of reference points for somebody pushing themselves through something like this and documenting the medical side. So, um, yeah, we did a huge amount of lab testing before I went and on the road collecting as many samples as we could whilst not getting in the way of performance. You know, if it took away from, took, took too much time, we just didn't do it because it was all about making the bike go faster. But for example, every morning we took saliva swabs uh, to see what my, you know, um, uh, hormone levels were doing. My cortisol level, my stress hormone, sat in high double digits for two and a half months. 
So most performance athletes would experience that for a period of time of their competition. That's quite natural to be switched on. There's very few documented examples of people being in that, under that degree of stress, you know, in terms of, you know, actually your hormones. For, so nobody, ha they never had to wake me at half past three in the morning. You know, I was up and out, even if it was four hours, four and a half hours on the bike. I was absolutely switched on. So that's the stress that you can put yourself under. The flip side to that is there has to be a, a fallout from it. When you stop, you really do crash, and it's not to be underestimated. Psychologically, it was really tough for two, three months off the back of this trip, and we're only six months on, and I, you know, I reflect with quite a lot of my team that sort of psychological roller coaster off the back of it. Um, you know, it's physiological as well. I went for a DEXA scan when I get back, which is a full body x-ray, bones, intramuscular fat, everything. My bone density was down because I hadn't walked for two and a half months. And if you're not fully weight bearing, then you, know, you, you, you lose that. So when I stood and took interviews in Paris and the days after I finished, my back and my legs killed me because I could quite happily ride 400K, but I could not run a 10K. You know, I, 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 I was fit for doing one thing. And that, so there was a lot of work when I came back. Sitting in that position, your, 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 hip flex, your hip angle's like this, your shoulders are in. You know, if you don't want to walk around like a duck for the rest of your life, there's quite a lot of work to be done. So the last six months has been quite interesting in a medical sense. Just one quick question. Um, upon reflection, is there anything you would have done differently? Um, I wouldn't have crashed so much. Um, well, what would I have done differently? Okay, here's the honest answer. This time last year, I had two major sponsors pull out. It amounted to just over 200,000. So within six months of the project, I went from um, focusing full-time as an athlete, training 35 hours a week, doing what I needed to do as an athlete, to getting back, firing my fundraiser, and um, getting back to the fundraiser myself. Taking weekly trips to London, you know, talking to sponsors, trying to... This time last year, the whole project nearly failed because we couldn't afford it. Um, so that is far from ideal as an athlete. You know, my job at that point in the final four or five months running in should have been purely to focus on performance. But there's something about, I mean, we, we covered some of that. We managed to get some of that sponsorship back, but not all of it. And I had to, I had to put some of my own savings into the... Basically, I was hoping to buy the family home, and we bought a smaller home. Um, but there's nothing like having a bit of skin in the game. You know, if this had all been an easy ride, and I got it easily funded, and I just focused on being an athlete, in a textbook sense, that would have been better for my performance. But there's something about that last four or five months and how scared I was. How scared I was that the whole thing was going to fail. How scared I was that I was going to get a few days out of Paris, not be able to hit an average of 240. And my life savings, you know, the commitment to the family to look after them and everything that we were doing was going to be down the pan. Um, that, that fear was a huge driver on the road, for good or bad. So the simple, the simple answer to your simple question is, I could have had a far better run into the start if I'd been allowed to just focus on being an athlete. But, yeah, there was something about the fear and the commitment in those final months which, which definitely sort of heightened the, you know, the, the focus when we actually got to being on the road. <laughs> it's an interesting point about motivation, and I guess it's a good place to finish. People always look at other people and say the word inspired. And I don't think inspiration, I think inspiration is, a, is, is an emotion which requires perspective. You can be inspired by other people, and that's a wonderful thing. But at what you feel yourself in the most important parts of any great ambition is not nearly so positive. I mean, if I'm, you know, if I've just smashed my face in in the middle of Russia, you know, don't give me a Muhammad Ali quote to get me back on the bike. I don't know what to do with that. You know, for me, tell me the consequence of failing. You know, I'll, I'll be sitting on the bike in my toughest days, repeating the consequences from not making it count in that moment. So the fear of failure sounds like a very melodramatic, negative thing. It's not. It's the real world. It's type two fun. It's the stuff that's miserable at the time. 
that you'll look back on most fondly. You know, when you're sitting there having your pint, that's type one fun. But when you're having your pint, you're talking about the stuff that nearly broke you but didn't. And, that, you know, that reality check, I think, is pretty important. You know, so I hope you're all inspired to go on adventures and journeys and to push yourselves. But be realistic to the fact when you're hurting, when you're 20 miles in on Sunday, um, you know, you might not feel inspired, but my God, you'll be motivated to finish and figure out your best. And that's not the same thing. And it's quite, quite useful to know. Because otherwise, you'll just go through life trying to do difficult things and hoping you feel inspired by it. Uh, you, you don't. You know, you suffer. You, 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 you hurt. You, you go through an incredible mental roller coaster. But my God, you will create your fondest memories. It's that old cliche that I reeled off at the start, which I use a lot when it's tough. You know, what would your 70-year-old self say? You know, good reference point for what's important. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. That's uh, brilliant. Thank you.